Well, a warm welcome to you this morning. Isn't it lovely having the sun out and coming to church with the weather like this? It's wonderful. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. We're, we're blessed today to have Caroline playing for us. That was lovely to have some music as we came in, wasn't it? And welcome to you if you're watching this online as well. Um, it's slightly low on numbers today. I think September must be holiday time for many people. But um, those of us who are here, we are so glad you're here. And we are here to worship God this morning and to bring ourselves before him and to hear his word. Um, Michael will be speaking to us from James chapter 3. We're continuing our series on James. So let's have a moment of prayer before we begin. Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend together worshipping you. We pray, Lord, that you would be here by your Holy Spirit, that you would speak through us to each other, you would speak through your word to us, that we would be hearers of the word and doers of the word. And we pray that our worship would be pleasing, you to, pleasing to you today. We lift our hearts up to you, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we have a time to praise and thank God. And you might be thinking of something that you want to thank him for. And when the time comes, you'll be able to share that. And we can thank and praise him together. Blessed are you, holy God, creator, redeemer, and life giver. You have spoken the world into being and filled it with wonder and beauty. For every blessing we have received, we give you thanks and praise. For sun and rain, time and seasons, we, we give you thanks and praise. For family and friends and people of every language and culture, we, we give you thanks and praise. Now if you'd like to share something, anybody got anything they'd like to thank God for? Builders. Builders. <laughs> and the beautiful morning we have is peace and quiet. Thank you for the person who left the beams in the porch. They're gratefully received. <laughs> That's lovely. Wherever you break our tape. Great. Thanks, Pete. I hope you're not jealous too young girls played tennis last night as your group. Have you looked in the world about what we could possibly be able to do? Great. <laughs> for every blessing we have received, we, we give you thanks and praise. And now let's come before God and confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. And the collect for today. God, who in generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire of your love, grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel, that, always abiding in you, they may be, they may be found steadfast in faith and active in service. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now we'll have our readings. The first reading is from the epistle of James, chapter 3, and beginning to read at verse 1. Taming the tongue. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of a pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour, for, pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives? Or a grapevine, figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, starting at verse 27 through to the end. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd of his disciples and said to them, if you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. 
For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what would it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? <clears throat> those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed of them when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of Christ. Pray before I start, yes. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us, and I pray that you will speak to us through these two passages and through my words. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As um, Joe said, we're looking at um, James at the moment, in James chapter 3, which was one of the readings. But as always, when I look at the associated passage, I find that there are really interesting connections between the two passages, for good reason. Whoever designed the lectionary must have designed the connection between them. So quite a lot of what I'm going to say um, relates to the Gospel passage. And the reason for that is because it's there, but the other reason is that it, I think it unfolds some of the points that James is making in um, chapter 3. This letter, James as a whole, is full of practical advice. And this morning's passage is no exception. And it's a message for those who are or aspire to be teachers. And I taught for many years, and I guess when I stand up in front of you, I am teaching. So I feel quite challenged, of course, by reading it. But I don't think it's just relevant to this group of people. It helps all of us as we listen to and act upon the words of others. The passage is about, I think the passage is about discernment. It's about discerning truth. It's about discerning what is important, what is significant, and what we can act upon. And I hope I'll be able to pull that out as we go uh, through my talk. And at the same time, our Gospel passage provides us with a wonder, what I consider to be a wonderful cameo in the life of Jesus, and it illustrates um, James's points. It's one of those passages, you know how there are some passages in scriptures that really hit you? Um, for me, this one is, is this one. Uh, when we discover Peter saying to Jesus, you are the Messiah. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. But I think there's a lot more in it than that. I've always just been excited by the fact that Peter recognised it, but it's saying a lot more than that, because I don't think he quite got it, even though he said that he was the Messiah, as I will unfold. So James gives us five simple pictures. The first two are about control and how a few words can control a great deal. So we have the bit in the bridle of the, of the horse, and I'm very pleased that um, certain people aren't in the... Probably there are lots of horsey people here, and they know all about bits and horses and the Vegas idea, but I believe that a small bit will control a whole horse if you've trained the horse properly. And the small rudder, which I know a bit more about, steering a mighty ship. You've got that idea of a very small thing can have a very important significance, and that's really something we all know about with words. And the third is about the effect of words. They can spread like wildfire. And the fourth and fifth are about truth, water flowing from a spring and a fig tree bearing fruit. There are no such things, says James, as half-truths. You can't at the same time speak truth and falsehood. You're either speaking the truth or you're speaking falsehood. That's the point. And they're really important messages for us 
as a community, especially in this world, particularly in these present times. They've always been important, but the power of media and communication, as I mentioned at the beginning, I can't remember the lady's name, but um, I know about her. Why? Because media is so powerful. And false news and half-truths can spread like wildfire and can, as seen in many countries in our world, control populations. Individuals can have enormous power through their words, even in this country, which is often described as a liberal democracy. So it's a really powerful and important passage that we need to take on board. But I think, as I've said already, the Gospel passage provides a wonderful example of what James is saying. James, uh, Jesus, of course, is the greatest teacher that ever was. And Peter, as always, is an interesting listener. The way that he reacts to Jesus is always fascinating and says so much about ourselves and how we respond to Jesus. And he often makes significant responses. So what I want us to do, I mean, the passage, is the passage up there? It would be nice to have the Gospel passage. Just back there, if that was feasible. I don't know where it is. Ah, the wonders of technology, isn't it great? Let's imagine the situation. Jesus and his disciples have been ministering. Jesus has been teaching and he's been, been performing miracles. And they went on, we read, to villages in Caesarea Philippi. And as they walk, you can just imagine it, can't you? As they walk towards Caesarea Philippi, Jesus turns to the disciples and asks them, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? It's not difficult to imagine it, is it? We, he might have been asking, what's the gossip about me? I've heard that said, what's the gossip? What's the gossip about me? What's going viral about me is a more contemporary way of describing it. And the disciples respond that some are saying he's John the Baptist, some are saying he's Elijah, and others one of the prophets. So they basically feed back what they know about what people are saying about Jesus. And Jesus listens to this. And I guess there might have been a pause. And then he says, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? In other words, disciples, what have you understood about what I have said and done? And Peter, always ready to respond, he's the sort of person that you'd love to have around because he's always there, ready. Volunteers words that seem to hit the nail on the head. That, that's the way I've always thought about it. They've hit the nail on the head. You're the Messiah. You are the Messiah. Peter's got it. He understands. He's made sense of it all. He recognises that their master, their teacher, is the awaited Messiah. Peter spent this time with Jesus, and through Jesus' actions and words, he recognises the Messiah, the King, who all Jews have been waiting for. Everybody is waiting for the Messiah in Israel. But wait a minute, the next stage in the conversation is particularly interesting. Why did Jesus so sternly tell Peter not to tell anyone about what Peter knew? Because what Peter said was only half true. It wasn't completely true. And if he'd shared it and if it had gone viral, it would have been a threat at that particular time. Jesus didn't want to share it at that moment. Peter doesn't have a full understanding of who the Messiah is. 
Because when Jesus goes on to speak about how he would undergo suffering, be rejected and killed, and after three days rise again, this was too much for Peter. He just couldn't take it. Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him. And in turn, we read, Jesus rebukes Peter for saying what he said. Why? Why did he? I've often found it difficult to understand why Peter rebuked Jesus. How did G Peter get it wrong? But remember that the common understanding amongst the Jews of who the Messiah was did not coincide with what Jesus was saying. Jewish belief was that the Messiah would be a mighty king, even greater than King David. They believed that the Messiah would come as a conqueror and would restore Israel, getting rid of their hated Roman rulers and their puppet king. He was going to come in triumph and sweep away everything, all the wrong, all the things that had happened in a huge gesture. They saw this king, he would come on a, a white charger or something like that and he would transform the nation. They believed that the Messiah King would live and <coughs> live forever. They believed that he would live forever. But this was not the Messiah that Jesus described. King Jesus was to be tortured and killed. His kingdom was a different kingdom. It wasn't a political, geographical kingdom. It's a kingdom that you and I are part of and Jesus is our King. And Peter took exception because he hadn't understood that. He hadn't taken it on board. So when Jesus told Peter not to tell anyone, he didn't want him to say, to convey the wrong notion of who the Messiah was. And in fact, it did go viral and the Jewish authorities were out to catch him because they didn't believe that he was what he said he was. Jesus knew that the news would spread like wildfire. And notice something else about that passage. Jesus, the great teacher, didn't use words to control Peter. I know he rebuked him, and he told, but he didn't use the words to control Peter. He didn't say, Peter, I know what you're saying about me as being a Messiah, but you're wrong. He didn't say that. He used his words to provide explanation that would enable Peter to reevaluate what he understood the Messiah to be. And notice, we haven't got the verses in front of us, but just a few verses on in that path, in that uh, in Mark's Gospel, um, Jesus has goes through the transfiguration and Peter's there, he sees Jesus transfigured and he sees that Jesus is God and Jesus is transformed and God says to him, you are my son with whom I'm well pleased. So finally, what can we learn? What can you and I learn from that? I think one message is to listen carefully and prayerfully. Look for truth and speak it. We don't have to be teachers to speak truth. Don't gossip. Go, don't gossip, even if the words are what we believe to be true. When all is said and done, Peter thought he knew, but he didn't. Be careful how we say things. Allow listeners to draw their own conclusion. Don't try to force conclusions. I remember, um, I haven't seen it for a while because I haven't been working in universities recently. Um, I used to see um, lots of Christians wearing wristbands with WWJD on them. Have you seen that? Have you thought, what on earth is that? WWJD stands for, I'm sure you all know, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? So let's 
spend time dwelling in the Gospels. I find it so good just letting the Gospels come to life and the stories come to life. And reflecting on the life of Jesus and thinking about our current circumstances, what would Jesus do? Amen. We thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your